On this second day in May, the month dedicated to children, our youngsters take the spotlight. We stop by the Greater Portmore Primary School where members of the Fire Wardens Club are... Preparing today for disasters tomorrow. Plus one young man's inspirational journey in the culinary arts and protecting children and adults alike from dangerous chemicals. A look at pesticide regulation in Jamaica. You're watching Jamaica Magazine. I'm Theodore Henry. Stay tuned. Parents, make sure the children get immunized. Hear this. Immunization, it is a must. This is not a joke thing, this you can trust. It is required by law for entry to nurses to daycare and to schools. Listen up, it is necessary to prevent diseases such as the measles, the poliomyelitis, the locked jaw, and the whooping cough. Immunize your kids, keep them healthy, keep them strong. Prevent deadly diseases such as mumps, rubella, and diphtheria. Immunize your child today. Immunization, a key to good health. A message from the Ministry of Health and PAHO. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, May 2. The state of emergency for St. James will remain in force until August 2. The House of Representatives approved the extension on Tuesday. As he advocated for the extension yesterday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness said the anti-crime measure had yielded significant results for St. James to date. From January 1 to April 30, the parish recorded 62 less murders than in the corresponding period last year. In addition, the Prime Minister says 133 persons have been arrested and charged 22 for murder. Also, eight major players in various conflicts in the parish have been either killed or arrested while resisting capture in operational exercises. Additionally, this has created the opportunity to gather information on gangs, find wanted persons and develop the cases around the main facilitators of crime. Mr. Holness says the enhanced security measures and the extraordinary powers given to the security forces are necessary to restore peace. So they are not just looking for murderers. They are looking to ensure that they can maintain good order, public order and safety. And when you speak to the citizens in Montego Bay and wider St. James, that is what they are saying. They are happy for the reduction in murders, yes, but they are also saying there is greater order in the parish. In other news, the island's unemployment rate is now at 9.6%. That sharp decline recorded as at January this year is more than four percentage points lower than the 13.7% rate of April 2016. Of particular note is that youth unemployment rate also declined, moving from 31.2% in January 2017 to 23.8% in January 2018. Prime Minister Andrew Holness was speaking at Tuesday's launch of Workers' Week and Labor Day 2018. He revealed that for male youth, the unemployment rate declined by 4.7 percentage points to 20.4%. Female unemployment dropped from 17% in January 2017 to 12.1% as at January 2018. It is the goal of this government that no one is left behind and that there is equal opportunity for every Jamaican to self-actualize. Government is setting up a $400 million special MSME production fund. This special window is being designed to ensure micro and small firms receive appropriate business development support services at affordable rates. Industry and Commerce Minister Audley Shaw made the announcement as he opened the 2018-2019 sectoral debate in Parliament Tuesday. He says further details will be provided later this month. In the meantime, Minister Shaw, who also manages the agriculture and fisheries portfolio, has announced advanced development work at two agroparks this year. He says $118 million has already been spent at Hounslow Agropark in St. Elizabeth and $85 million at Spring Gardens in Portland. The work at both sites will accelerate production on a total of 82 hectares of land, which will be leased to serious investors and farmers. I want to make it very, very clear. Those who lease the lands in these parks that have been outfitted with infrastructure, use it or lose it. 
We cannot afford to have people leasing land and having that land with infrastructure lying idle while people need to get work. Mr. Shaw says the ministry will also be partnering with Grace Kennedy to provide direct support to the government-owned packing house in Hounslow, which Grace currently operates under a lease. Over in Spring Gardens, the ministry has plans to engage with farmers to help boost banana exports. It was also announced yesterday that the Agriculture Ministry was successful in repurchasing 18,000 hectares of land from Pan-Caribbean Sugar Company. Of the lands reclaimed, 7,500 hectares will be given to the Money Musk Sugar Factory for cultivation of cane in order to optimize their productive capacity. The remaining 10,500 hectares will be utilized to produce non-sugar crops and will facilitate the rearing of livestock. These hectares of highly fertile alluvial, flat and mechanizable lands represent the largest contiguous area of lands in Jamaica suitable and ideal for this agricultural revolution. It is these lands that we will actively promote large investors to engage in onion production, fruit tree orchards, exotic crops whose production can make a qualitative difference. And finally, the Heart Trust NTA has been transferred to the OPM to be directly under the supervision of the Prime Minister. In making the announcement, Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the reassignment will ensure that there is greater synergy between the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation and Investment Promotion. He says government is seeing significant investment and interest in BPOs, tourism and hospitality, mining, construction and civil infrastructure. The Prime Minister argues that the immediate constraints on the expansion of these industries is the availability of skilled labor force to assume jobs in the sectors. Government has to be proactive in implementing human resource development policies that ensure alignment between the output of the education and training institutions and the skill demand of industries. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. One way to safeguard the health of our children is keeping dangerous chemicals out of their reach. Right now, best practices in using pesticides to protect the environment, yourself, and those little ones we all love. Pest control practices using hazardous substances require us to take necessary safety precautions to protect our health. Any misguided idea as to the danger that can result from toxic pesticides must be dismissed from our minds, as we can be caught off guard by the lengthy period that might elapse before any signs of illness sets in. At the level of government, the Pesticides Control Authority PCA is the entity enforcing the necessary safeguards by regulating importation, manufacturing, sale and use of pesticides. The issue of pesticides usage poses several benefits to our society, but also can pose several challenges also, because for every positive that it represents in terms of controlling adverse conditionalities, um, it also, if used improperly, can lead to challenges um, within the environment and also affect the, the, the citizens, the persons who use, or persons who are exposed. The Pesticides Control Authority partners with local and international bodies to fulfill its regulatory functions. That includes establishing the conditions under which these substances can be safely administered. Our website www.caribepesticides.net has a list of all registered products and each month the Board of the Pesticides Control Authority considers new ones new products. and uh, when they are approved they are added each month to that website list and occasionally we will remove products that were previously registered and that's a monthly process as well. In addition, 
um, the pesticide review committee goes through and looks at the the more toxic ones and decides whether to recommend to the board to phase them out or not. We have 48% uh, of products uh, which are used in agriculture sector, um, which belongs to the class four, which is less toxic products, least toxic products. On opposite end, the most toxic products, we have only 1.2% remaining in the uh, system. The most toxic pesticides are restricted and only authorized persons are allowed to use them, having been trained and certified by the authority. The PCA also certifies private applicators of pesticides, including farmers. Persons handling and applying pesticides are required to follow all the instructions on the label and must wear the designated safety gear. At hand at all times should be protective clothing, gloves, boots, and eyeglasses. Application should be done in a manner that limits human contact. We have seen persons being poisoned, basically, because of adverse exposure. Um, take, for example, rodents and, and, and the, the, the substance that is used to get rid of rodents. If it's, if it's, if it's placed in the wrong place, um, it does affect those who are exposed to it. And in fact, the data that I've seen show that on average about 40 persons a year are affected um, adversely because of the inappropriate application of that particular um, pest control substance. Pesticides approved by the PCA are more easily monitored to ensure health and safety. But those that are illegally concocted and made available commercially or imported pose significant risks for unsuspecting consumers. The problem with these, as far as the persons buying it should be concerned, is they don't really know what they are getting. So for example, we have bought a rat bait that we saw being sold that is locally manufactured illegally. And when tested in the lab, there was nothing in there that could kill a rat. So the persons buying that product were only feeding the rats. The other problem we have is that there are illegal pesticides coming in through the ports or through other avenues, I suppose. Biggest problem are the black mosquito coils. The problem with them is that we have not got any application to have them registered, so we don't really know how um, much of a health risk they are. But we have got some reports that especially children and people with respiratory problems have been affected. In fact, they are probably just too good. So they affect not only the mosquitoes and the flies, but the humans at, as well. <laughs> um, some of them contain active ingredients that are, we know that are a real problem. And even if an application came in to register them, we would not want to do so. Then there's some other things, such as this um, chalk, which a child would think is a regular piece of chalk that they see in the, at their school. And then there are some things that are in um, plastic bottles. Um, these are very common. Again, the, the wristbands, that's not a registered product. Persons are also placed at high risk when products are removed from their original manufacturer's container and repackaged inappropriately. And again, how does a person buying something like that know that what they are getting is the real thing? Even within the household, it's a dangerous practice to transfer pesticides to things like soda bottles or plastic bags for storage. Unfortunately, children in the home can get a hold of it. And children end up in hospital all the time because of that problem, particularly eating rat bait. It has to be locked away and properly labeled. Uh, we also recommend to the farmers use very simple, inexpensive methods of storage. You don't need to be very, um, you know, elaborate or fancy. You can use just a maybe old shelf of refrigerator or old filing cabinet, or just simply a wooden box. For its part, the Pesticides Control Authority regularly collects samples of local and imported agricultural foods to test for residual pesticide levels. 
farmers are encouraged to do their own due diligence by first determining the percentage of pesticide to use and following the label instruction for things such as dilution rates and the correct time to spray. The PCA provides simplified information to help in this process. We have done a mini survey to determine what possible practices the farmers are doing that could be causing the problem and then we are going to be training them specifically in those. Farmers can also minimize the use of pesticides by practicing biological and cultural control methods such as barrier crops, sticky traps and crop rotation. Whether for commercial use, on the farm or in the home, make pesticide use a last resort. Or failing that, make it a priority to handle pesticides safely because the life saved could just be your own. For more information, you can visit the Pesticides Control Authority website at caribpesticides.net. You can also email pca at cwjamaica.com. children and we have rights. We have a right to be protected, provided for, and included. Don't beat me up, don't belittle me, and please don't molest me. I am under 13. I should not be working for a living. That is child labor. It is illegal. Start leaving me alone. I am too young to provide for myself. I need your guidance. Protect our nation's children. They have rights too. To learn more about children's rights, call or visit the offices of the Child Development Agency. I know you will agree with me when I say children can do more than we sometimes suspect they can. Watch as one group of primary students take up the challenge to become beacons of safety. Move to right in threes. Right turn. Move to left in three. Squad will retire. Left turn. A ball turn. This is not training for the cadet corps. There is a new co-curricular club in schools, the Fire Wardens Club. The Jamaica Fire Brigade has embarked on a new initiative. It involves children and is being implemented in schools across the country. The initiative is similar to that of many other school-based co-curricular programs. The only difference? This club reinforces the importance of disaster preparedness, management and restoration. The main aim is to reduce the country's susceptibility to significant damage from natural and man-made disasters. Ready? Down! Up! What to do if fire? The program is now being implemented in schools across the country since its inception at institutions in St. Catherine in 2017. Welcome to Great School Fire Warden's Club. What do you feel when you feel an earthquake? Shaking. Yes. Things falling. Things falling. Yes. And you are frightened too. When I showed you the video, yeah. did you see where the road split? Yes. And you saw cars going down into the oh, between yeah. the Yes. We initially started with a quiz competition that went on to the primary school. So we realized that we needed something a little more tangible where we can actually have the fire wardens club in the school. The motto of the club is We are preparing these students so that whenever there's a disaster, they will be ready to help within the schools, home, and churches. So we would teach them to be ready when there's an earthquake, so they would know the, 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 the procedure, they would know the drill. We prepare them to help their schoolmates if somebody got injured and need to be moved from one place to the other. If there's a fire, we also taught them about the bucket brigade. They can get some water. You might have known that there are times when children are trapped, children are also burnt in fires. 
Now, if these children were taught and have some idea of what to do, the possibility that they could have helped themselves. Within the schools, a teacher is assigned to the club and for that purpose is given the title of a superintendent. Our students are very enthusiastic about the club and they get involved in many different activities as it pertains to knowing and disseminating information about disasters and disaster mitigation. One of the best agents for information are children and parents respond to children. So when the children know certain things about how to manage disasters, what are some of the right things to do, they can help to inform their parents and in turn the parents will inform the community members to respond. And in a community like Portmore, where there are so many potential disasters waiting to happen, it is important that Greater Portmore, at the schools in Greater Portmore, know about fire wardens and become involved in it. Fire wardens clubites are also engaged in humanitarian activities, visiting children's and nursing homes. I just love how they do things. You have to do them proper and if you don't do them proper, sometimes you get kicked out of the club. The Fire Wardens Club is very fun and I get to do drills like fire safety, earthquake, tsunamis and fire drills because it helps us to blow out fires. The Fire Warden Club teaches us to do a drill, teaches us when you're to do, to what to do when your clothes is on fire. Stop, drop, cover your face and roof. It's a great club to join and I love it because you have fun and it's helping your community and schools to, to raise disaster awareness. If someone's house is being flooded out, I can help them by doing check, take them out of the house and take out the good stuff like the birth, like the birth papers and the passports. Loss of life and property as a result of natural and man-made disasters should be minimized as the Fire Wardens Club expands and more children get involved. How well do you know your child? What he or she likes or dislikes? Favorite food? Or color. How about who their friends are? Make the time. Get to know your child. It helps to build their relationship. Makes it easy to keep them safe and it helps their development process. Up next, meet Garfield Seavright, a young chef whose story proves the adage whatever the mind can conceive, it can achieve. Check this out. Well, I consider myself as a typical youth. Friends, sports. Dolphin, well, not so typical, but I enjoy the sport. Average social life and vision for the future. I want to go straight on in depth of the culinary, which is, I want to do level four, which is the executive chef level. So I'll be going straight up to the top. I'm Chef Berkeley Jr. from Hartress NTA, Boys Town to be exact. After high school, I met a uh, close friend which, which of my sister, um, Alex White. I don't know that Alex the Great. Um, he started bringing me on events because I told him that I'm interested in food and he was at a higher level, a way higher level. So while traveling with him around places, I learned a lot. He was a great mentor. Today I'll be cooking a octopus wrapped in spring roll. So we're starting with the onions. We'll put this in the bowl. So here we have the octopus. Freeze that day before. It's kind of tender because I bought it tender. So we're just going to blanch it in the water. We're going to do this four times. The Heart Trust NTA was established in 1982 to satisfy the demand for solutions to the persistent problem of underdevelopment in the country. 
Fast forward to 2017, where the institution has maintained that mandate and has been shaping the lives of many youth through technical and vocational training. Garfield came here, he joined the food prep level three, which is a chef de party, actually being prepared as a supervisor. I walked in the lab one day and here was this young man at work. What I saw him was doing, they usually are not that exposed already. You know, I saw this, man, this young man creating this, and I said, who are you? You're not, a, you're, a level, you're not a level three. And he said, yes, I'm a level three. Having Garfield here at Boystone was a plus. We have had many before him, but Garfield has come and he has put his mark. Boystone is more into the practical, heart is more into practical, and it has given me a drive, open opportunity because... He was selected to represent Jamaica in the first international TVET Youth Forum during World Skills Abu Dhabi 2017 on October 14 and 15. This event was the first of its kind and a unique opportunity for young professionals to shape the future of skills. And that is the opportunity based from Taste of Jamaica. Organized annually by the Culinary Federation of Jamaica, CFJ. It features cook-offs in more than 18 categories. Taste of Jamaica is geared towards promoting and showcasing the country's most talented through a mix of competition. Garfield entered in the category CPJ Beef Competition, where he walked away with silver in the 2016 staging of the event. It was really a big move because I was competing against the sous chef of Sandals and a sous chef of Sandals for a level 3 person and you're probably level 5 or 4. So it was a big move. You rarely find young people with the passion and also the drive to endure and to keep on going. I think his advantage is that he smiles at obstacles. He's always moving on, pressing forward and uh, you know, just getting the job done. For youths now, if you have a good opportunity, take it, but think about it. Definitely think about it. Secondly, um, if you want to pursue food and nutrition, definitely come to either Boys Town Heart of St. A or Runaway Bay Heart. Now let us see him finish up the octopus spring roll. Get that This is Chinese favorite wrap, made of flour, rolled really thin. We're gonna have some cheese in there. One strips like this, this is okay. So we're going to layer them like this. Get this in here. Over. There you go. Inside. To get more information on this program and others offered by Heart Trust NTA, you can visit their website at heart-nta.org. You can, there you have it. Octopus spring roll with salsa and olive oil. That's all we have for you on the show today. We love feedback, so send us yours. Drop us a line in an email or on our social media pages. Watch this and any other editions of Jamaica Magazine by visiting our website, jis.gov.jm. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Theodore Henry. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.